Hi, I'm Ann Rieselbach, the League's Program Director. Welcome, welcome to today's celebration of the publication Young Architects 21 Just, which documents the work and ideas of the 2019 winners of the Architectural League Prize for Young Architects and Designers, Rachel Barnard, Jennifer Bonner, Virginia Black, Rosanna El Khatib, and Gabrielle Prince, Mira Hasman Henry, Gregory Melatanov. Cyrus Penaroyo, and all of them will be taking part in today's presentations and discussion. They will be joined by Isabel Abascal, Bryony Roberts, and Anya Sirota, the 2019 League Prize Committee members and past competition winners who drafted the original competition theme, Just, and shaped today's event. Their call for entries um, text opened with the observation that the idea that an architecture work might be just, whether formally, materially, contextually, culturally or otherwise, invokes the diverse and independent, interdependent concerns that shape contemporary practice. They asked competition entrants to consider the just and how they approach the practice of architecture, whether through experimentation in research, design advocacy, or by advancing speculative and applied techniques. You can find more details about the competition, including biographical information about the winners on the League's website. The pandemic and other logistical issues slowed the publication process considerably for Just, which you um, can pick up at stores now. Um, but in a sense, this time lag provided a welcome opportunity to revisit the theme and to reflect on what the past few years have meant for design practices. We asked all of the winners to pair an example of their work at the time of the competition with the current project and describe briefly, given the time constraints of this program, what has changed and what has not in their approach to just design and more generally their role in the profession. Following the presentations will be a time for discussion, first with the League Prize Committee and then with the audience. And you can please post your questions in the Q&A section. And since this is indeed a book launch, the team at Oro has provided a 20% discount code that will be posted in the chat section during the lecture. Before we begin, a few thanks are due. First to the 2019 program sponsors, Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown, Hunter Douglas Architectural, Rachel Judlow, Elizabeth Kubani, and Tischler and Son. The publication was also supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. And a special thanks goes to Gordon Goff and the team at Oro Editions, who now co-published this series, and the next volume is going on press very soon. On the editorial side, this publication was guided by consulting editor Andrea Monfried and designer Jenna Scher, and realized through the work of managing editor and past league program manager Katerina Flaxman. Rafi Lehman, the league's current program manager, shepherded the book through the final stages of printing and distribution. And with that, on to the contributors. Um, hello. Um, I think I'm starting starting us off. Uh, thanks, and. Um, Thanks Anne, Anya, Briney, and Isabel for bringing us together again, and shout out to Rafi for coordinating this event. Um, I co-lead a design collaborative called Extents with McLean Clutter. Uh, in short, we turn, uh, we turn architecture's disciplinary silos inside out by cultivating diverse partnerships and by designing physical environments that interweave various tech social, technological, and aesthetic concerns. We resist the tendency to dismiss architectural work as not that and just this, and we strive to be consistently out of category by critically engaging the limits of design. Uh, one of the projects in my 2019 portfolio submission was Lossy Lossless, a temporary environment for a nonprofit arts organization called Materials and Applications, or MA, based in Los Angeles. The project used a, a public storefront space as a site through which to vivify the changing urban image of the neighborhood. Uh, the storefront, uh, uh, next slide. Uh, the storefront is at the base of this relatively new residential building on Sunset Boulevard in Echo Park. Uh, at the time, we noticed that the neighborhood was rapidly gentrifying. When m and approached us about this project, they explained that our installation would be programmed with various community activities throughout its duration. In support of their mission to engage different publics through art and architecture, our project sought to bring the street into the space and provide a forum for discussing the politics and stakes surrounding the neighborhood's transformation. Uh, next slide. In our design, we gathered uh, what we saw as markers of the boulevard's past and future. Next. Uh, and assembled these elements into a rendered and reflective wall covering that lined the storefront's interior. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, we also filled the space with an occupiable forescape assembled from an off-the-shelf system that we covered with custom foam padding. Next slide. Uh, and the, the following slides just show uh, photos of the installation. Uh, so images of street life. Next slide. Um, how people could occupy the floorscape. Next slide. Uh, the multi-layered expression of componentry. Next slide. And how the interior glowed at nightfall. Um, ult ultimately, we thought of our design for the storefront as a kind of thick layered tableau in which image and object, inhabitant and passerby, mix and mingle as a part of a condensed community reflection. Um, after we helped to launch the space in 2019, uh, m has since used the storefront for other events and programs with executive director K.E. Chu and previously Jia Yi Gu at the helm. Uh, more recently, they accepted donations in partnership with local organizations to support unhoused uh, neighbors, and that's what these images um, here are showing. Uh, next slide. Uh, for extents, Lossy Lossless, uh, along with world events, marked a change in the work that we pursue. Uh, more specifically, we've been rethinking the frameworks for public engagement with the help of digital tools, developing projects in partnership with community groups, and exploring the reciprocity between identities and the built environments that support them. I believe that just design requires an awareness of our own positions, privileges, and experiences in relation to others. Uh, working on Las y Las as a, a Filipino-American, I was drawn to historic Filipino town as one of many immigrant communities near m and storefront. Uh, and in fall 2021, I revisited this part of LA for another project also about urban transformation. Um, that year, Time Magazine had reported an alarming uh, statistic. According to National Nurses United, as of April 2021, 24% of the nurses they surveyed who died from COVID-19 complications were Filipino, but Filipinos only make up 4% of the total registered nurses in the country. In other words, Filipino American nurses have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Um, before she retired, uh, my own mother worked night shifts as a registered nurse in an, in, a, in an emergency room in Missouri, which is where I grew up. And throughout the past few years, I've been thinking a lot about her experience as one of thousands of Filipino nurses recruited by American medical institutions and wondering why this transnational workforce exists in the first place. Uh, next slide. Um, this heightened awareness of my Filipino American identity prompted by this disconcerting data led me to think about the, the appearance of cultural identity in our surroundings. For instance, if Filipinos play an essential role in the American healthcare system, why aren't they ever represented in medical TV shows? Uh, what is the status of Filipino towns and Little Manilas compared to other urban areas with high ethnic concentrations? And what role does the built environment play in, in shaping our perceptions of Filipino and American collectivity? Um, in response to an open call for films about night shift workers, I set out to make a film with spatial and temporal discontinuities that could at least prompt discussion about the social, political, and material consequences of this international labor condition. Um, how can I use my training as an architect and work from my own diasporic narrative to get at some of the underlying feelings of being here and elsewhere, seen and unseen in space and in time? Next slide. Um, there's more historical framing that I can provide for this project, but in the interest of time, I'll just show a few screenshots of the video. Next slide. Um, I wanted to create something that would dislocate the viewer in space and time. And you can see that um, from the screenshot, there's two main components, images and captions, which are synced to a voiceover. Uh, the footage shows storefronts, signs, um, and other urban infrastructures that rep uh, in the area that represent Filipino culture. Uh, next slide. And images are, are nested to create a constant dance of alignment and misalignment, synchrony and, as and asynchrony. Next slide. Um, while the visuals depict historic Filipino town during the, the daytime, the audio describes the rooms, hallways, and in inventory of a hospital at nighttime, ending with a nurse's station. Next slide. Uh, through these simultaneous des descriptions of historic Filipino town and hospitals, the film attempts to simulate an out of syncness of night shift nurses that could only be understood through experience. Next slide. Uh, so just the last few slides here, the film, um, which is titled Manifest Destiny, was screened for the first time at Exhibit Columbus in November 2021, um, alongside a film by Julia Cesar McQuarrie. And this is a photo of a public discussion between myself, uh, JC, and Anne Louis of Future Firm. Next slide. Um, this is a shot um, of the film as part of Future Firm's Midnight Palace installation. And then next slide. Um, I'll just end with a link to the Night Gallery's website in case you want to view the film uh, in its entirety. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, 
Well, first, thanks for having us here. Um, we are very happy that we can be together again, even if virtually. So um, in our six-ish minutes, we uh, wanted to revisit um, a project that usually takes about 20 minutes to get into. So um, we're just gonna give you a very quick uh, version of it. Um, next, please. This is a series of projects we began as Post Fortis Time and Factory. Under its umbrella, we have produced research and objects to better see the cultural and technological production of virginity, a force that conditions the experience and political horizons for women, generally speaking across the world, but particularly in the MENA region. Next, please. This involved looking at the spaces where bodily materials circulate as commodities. So a manufactured membrane that retails at anywhere from $30 to $400 for many is a cheaper alternative to surgical hymenoplasties that range between $1,000 to $4,000. The elective procedure figures as a part of a broader industry of medical tourism, where women travel to clinics in places like Beirut for hymenoplasty, vaginal rejuvenation, and other surgical procedures. Next, please. The insertable hymen suppository and similar products also figure into a larger inquiry of a pantheon of designed objects that render the body, particularly bodies with vaginas and those that menstruate, more visible, extensible, and more sexually available. We were interested in the technology and design things that change the form or capacity of the body to perform it, uh, to perform in specifically gendered ways. Next, please. How such objects are put to use was demonstrated by Rosanna at the Milan Triennale in 2019, who heightened the performance of inserting the commercially available virginity hymen product into a transparent flashlight, a reproduction of the company's own instructional media. Next. We explored how products and procedures that simulated virginity were spatialized and made coextensive with similarly hymenoplastic environments those that were designed to seem and inspire bodily transformations. And this also conditioned a kind of fantasy other space wherein the body might be remade or redesigned to suit the needs and desires of many possible patients and allowed us to entertain hymenoplasticity in its most expansive possibility. Next. So we went to Beirut to visit the real clinics where this work of reconstruction occurred. And we became very interested in these spaces that comprise some amalgam of the hospital, the spa uh, and the boutique hotel. So it was a project that really depended on field work, uh, peering in sight and ultimately reproducing physical interiors to get close to something so intimate. Uh, next. This research culminated in an exhibition at Gallery Biper in Prague as a physical and virtual simulation of the clinic environment. Next. Here's us in the self-examination chair, which absorbs some of the artifacts we showed in the earlier cosmology of hymen objects, but it also riffs on a practice of um, so-called menstrual extraction uh, advocated by feminist health centers of the 1980s. These were essentially self-managed abortions, now suddenly relevant again. Um, and spoke to what you might be empowered to do propped up on some pillows between trusted friends, a speculum, a hand mirror. Um, so in the previous slide, you saw Virginia wearing an Oculus headset that provided access to this other part of the clinic. Uh, next, a virtual OR where you could hear narrative accounts of women who had received time in a plastic procedures. Next. Here's the red room, our recovery suite that's dressed with a disposable rug, a membrane for the room made from um, bubble wrap that pops when uh, you walk on it uh, and it can be easily replenished when it's ruptured beyond repair. Next. And these are versions of that curtain self-examination space that we showed in New York um, as part of the Arc League exhibition and then later in Singapore at NTU. So the long rollout of this work was to try to understand what simulation does in specific contexts, what it responds to, what are the spatial regimes of hymen reconstruction and how design is really operative on the body and um, on the spaces in which that body seeks kind of care. Next. The next chain of projects that has brought us closer to our current fixation was similarly centered on the body and its accommodation or non-accommodation under the legal structures of national belonging. So in December of 2019 into January of 2020, we spent a few weeks in residence at Darit al Funun to develop some research and writing we had done um, on the materiality of citizenship under the terms of eusanguinists or national belonging by blood. 
and the circumstances under which that was denied. We looked specifically at the paternal interpretation of eusanguinous in 25 nations across the world and in, 20, and in 14 of the 22 member um, states of the Arab League, where women are specifically denied the right to, produce, to reproduce or confer their own citizenship. And we had also explored that through a commission for the second Biennale of Architecture in Orléans in a composition of 14 hand flown, hands flown on um, two flags on, on the Rue um, Jeanne d'Arc, which is what you see on the right on this slide. Next. The, res the residency in Amman was really the last piece we all went together. Um, that was right before the beginning of the pandemic. And it was sort of the end of a period of a lot of travel. It felt like coming home because it was literally my home, but also um, home to each other in a place where this research mattered. Next, please. It produced essentially a counterfeit passport operation, which is one way that you can undermine the law that designs belonging in limited ways. We conducted this through a series of workshops and next, in a resulting exhibition next. We left Amman and returned to New York and it wasn't long before we found ourselves spending the rest of 2020 more or less apart from each other. The exhibition traveled when we could not. Passport was installed remotely in Vienna and we gave a virtual opening talk on Zoom, next. And even in the two years of Zoom panels and lectures, we found a way to be together on screen in the virtual bed at Chapman, next. So the last two years have looked much different for us. It has afforded us an opportunity to not give in to work or the continual call to produce um, and instead do basically what we needed to do to get by. Uh, so staying home or getting out on the streets, being immobilized and responding to the urgent need to mobilize. So we thought a lot about what you have to risk by assembling in a pandemic and what is risk by not showing up. And that's informed um, some new directions of work on care as a kind of dependency, uh, needing each other as a vital relation and not as a lack. So where our initial response to Jess was rooted in an essential refusal, a kind of no that is a complete sentence, we're reckoning with what it takes to hold on to that no. It's not so much about refusal as giving in, but moving towards something that looks at the foundation of accommodation and support that it really takes to refuse work, to refuse complicity, and to refuse the bad politics of the moment. Against continual demands to produce talks like these or texts or exhibitions or whatever, we've slowly become more protective of what we might expend in the process. Uh, to feel out when work is necessary and when it compromises the web of needs we've forged between us. When can this work be directed to other measures of support? When does it feel integral and means of closing the distance between working on ourselves and working on the world? Uh, when what binds us might be a project and when it dwells in the part of us that's not an office. So we scale the wall between these places embedded as they are in each other how to swim in contaminated fonts of love and solidarity and suffering. Uh, next, together, if we can. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. That was amazing. Um, my name is Rachel Barnard. I'm uh, an artist, designer, and the founder of Young New Yorkers. Next. Um, and thank you to the League for um, including me in this and um, creating this amazing book uh, that really shows my colleagues and I's work so powerfully. I really recommend you get it. Um, so what is Young New Yorkers? Uh, we're an arts-based diversion program for young people, um, many of who are prosecuted as adults. Uh, next. Because uh, we work inside the criminal legal system, one of our core principles is obviously uh, not jail and that young people can find a pathway for themselves that allows them to the exit the criminal legal system um, swiftly and with uh, minimum collateral consequences. Next, please. Um, and uh, we're very proud, um, the teams, uh, 
extremely proud that since 2012 over 1500 young people have been sentenced to make art with us rather than other sanctions um, and here's some of our extraordinary young people there um, but underlying this uh, direct service or running parallel with this is an idea of transformative justice that takes uh, the complicated web of injustices inside the criminal legal system uh, and uh, holds them separately and then allows the young people to create something new that might be in its place uh, next. So we like to say that our young people bring positive systematic change through the way that they express themselves in courtroom exhibitions and other art advocacy that they engage in. Next. So here are the courtroom exhibitions. I'm going to, I think I'm going to focus on one, but um, I love this slide um, of Monica with her, her grandparents who just eight weeks before this picture were being driven nuts. <laughs> um, so that was wonderful. Next. Uh, so I'm going to take you through something that was included in my portfolio um, uh, for this prize, which is the courtroom spectacular. And you can see here that the young people have created an incredible collage that um, imagines what the space of the courtroom or what the space of so-called justice could be um, and then blown it up into a, an immersive experience. Next. Uh, and they were very uh, interested in um, brain science that we as a society understood that young people are impulsive to about the age of 25 and yet we hold at that time held um, 16 year olds account like adults. Um, some of the consequences being lifelong um, and they were very um, engaged uh, in the tension between these two realities and the injustice it represented. Next. Um, so as you arrived, um, the judges and the prosecutors and the defense attorneys, as they arrived, they had to identify, self-identify um, what kind of brain they had, whether they had a child brain, an adult brain, an adolescent brain, and in some cases um, for the over 70 year olds, a senior brain. Um, and on the back of um, that ID was a quiz where you were asked, how old are you when, when you're treated as an adult in the criminal legal system? How long does a criminal record last your whole life? Um, when is your brain developed to really like test people's knowledge of these um, intersecting but conflicting uh, realities that don't support each other and in fact very harmful to young people? Next. So here's the head judge of the Eastern District Court um, filling out a quiz with Hectavius 17, next. Um, and another person being awarded for getting a lot of right answers on their quiz, next. Um, and, you know, after, you know, they did that and, um, you know, everyone's wearing their brain development around their necks. You were asked to envision what could be, how could we bring these realities together in a more careful, just, caring, kind way. And uh, the young people would read these visions of the people that the guests had created. And then because half of this group wanted to be tattoo artists, they turned the back of the courtroom into a tattoo parlor and offered a word of affirmation to each guest based on what their vision was. Um, so every guest um, left feeling really seen and acknowledged by the young people. Next. And um, People's visions were tied to uh, hydrangeas because according to the group, they looked like brains and you were you randomly received somebody else's vision as you left tied to a flower. And so this created a space of generosity and centered the young people's leadership and experience. And this is Judge Grasso and Judge Calabrese um, uh, uh, being ushered out by Sean Michelle. Next. Um, art advocacy uh, is, has been at the core of 
our organization since the beginning. And you can see here some self portraits that were created in the one day program in 2013. And we simply hung them off the banister so that the, in front of the prosecutors and the defense attorneys, so that while the young people remain silent as to not put anything on the record, their own visual description of who they are beyond their rap sheets was present in the courtroom and they could advocate for themselves. Next. Um, some of the portraits were breathtakingly beautiful and had a huge impact um, on the way that uh, the young people's case was decided, um, mostly leading to cases being completely dismissed and sealed. Next. Um, so I'm really excited to share that we took 300 of these portraits that have been create, created over the last few years, especially through our arrest diversion program. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you listen to Amira. I'm Amira, I'm 19 years old. I want to live a life that people say she learned a lot from that. Like that's what I think one of my passions is, is living a life where I know I'm gonna be proud of it at the end of it. Um, so basically what happened in my arrest is me and um, a friend, we had just met that day. Um, we were both artists, so we were um, doing our tags, our art tags around um, downtown. And um, we were drawing, she saw the police behind us, so she started running and I started running with her. These two huge guys are running, they're sprinting after us. And my friend falls behind because she's wearing a... Um, hi, my name is Mira Henry. Thank you so much um, to all the, the, the past presenters. It's so wonderful to see everybody's work right now um, and to be revisited um, by their, their visions um, and the work that they've been ongo doing ongoing. So the work that I did um, uh, when I uh, applied and went for, for the Architecture League, I did under my own name, Mira Henry, um, and since then have developed a collaborative office called Current Interests with Matthew Au. And I'm gonna show, it was a kind of a rapid succession from when I won the ARC League um, to when we kind of lectured, Matthew and I were kind of developing our, our collaborative work together. So the work I'm gonna show today is representative of some of the, the projects or a, a single project that was very key in my own portfolio, applying for just as well as um, the ways in which that work has evolved um, and kind of expanded um, and, and become um, more layered um, since then. Um, again, my office is called Current Interest. Next. Um, so Matthew and I really think about um, kind of an idea about gathering, gathering content, gathering histories, um, gathering interests, of course. Um, next. And zooming into this tableau, um, kind of digital tableau of, of physical material that we produced um, are a set of images of a project um, called Rough Coat. And this is a, a project that um, uh, uh, I did when I was um, in 2018 um, for the SciArc Gallery. Um, next. And Rough Coat um, was a very important project um, in, in uh, in my own kind of evolution and thinking. It was a project, um, uh, the idea of it, um, which sounds a little funny, but the idea of it is um, developing a um, facade scale blanket. Um, it was panelized, it was 18 foot by 18 foot panelized system. Um, it was very much about um, uh, craft and about tectonics, um, as well as about looking at um, the existing conditions in the city. Next. Um, at the time, I'd been doing research looking at um, houses in a particular neighborhood and understanding the history of a particular neighborhood in Los Angeles, which is where I live. Um, very small houses with many, many layers um, from the front yard up to the cladding of it, including um, blinds and drapery and um, shingles and paint, vivid paint often, um, and systems of privacy and landscape that build up on that front and the sort of character of it. This is um, um, not unique in Los Angeles and um, um, also a sort of signature of many neighborhoods, particularly working class neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are kind of primarily black and brown in LA. Um, 
And so I wanted to sit with these houses and look at these houses carefully. Next. And so Rough Coat was really thinking of really about how do you kind of move between both the kind of heavy layers of an exterior, the presence of it, the tactility of it, um, um, the kind of armor of it, as well as the, an idea about a projected interior, a space of privacy, a space of domesticity and intimacy. Um, next. So Rough Coat was about really bringing together this idea of an exterior and interior, um, a system of cladding, a system that is far more provisional intimate um, and, um, and fugitive, let's say, say in this case, the blanket. So the material was um, uh, really came out of studying carefully um, upholstery techniques. Um, things were tufted and sewn and layered up with upholstery foam and coated with um, a variety of materials, including elastomeric stucco or stucco that is um, um, flexible, really studying how to think about the presence of an exterior system like stucco, which is quite prevalent in LA, and how that could be um, become far more um, uh, flexible, quite literally. Next. Um, and Rough Coat was also very much about creating an, um, a setting, an environment, a place to inhabit. So it wasn't just about bringing material in and about the object, but about an, a, a space for, for rest, a space for gathering. Um, the walls are painted very dark. Um, lighting was kind of calibrated very specifically. And some of the photographs that you're seeing um, were done by Tia Thompson, who's a portrait photographer, and really thinking about what does it mean to think about architecture, maybe um, outside of um, it as um, it as an object, but more it as a frame, a frame for living. Um, so these photographs start to, you start to get a sense of kind of the, the way that color um, and the kind of interior of the space um, becomes, um, starts to kind of uh, create um, um, different color environments. So in some photographs, you understand the space is very, very green and saturated. Next. In others, kind of pinkish brown, depending on the way that the kind of light and, and, um, and the materials start to commingle. Next. Um, and, you know, I would say that this project is also very much sort of anticipating an idea about um, uh, an architecture that's uh, almost points to sort of a nomadic architecture, an architecture that can um, uh, respond to touch, can be kind of moved and packed up, can become almost quite personal, almost like a garment, like a hoodie or something that you can kind of put on. What would it mean to think about an, a building in that manner? Next. Um, and of course, it was also a space of kind of play. Next. Um, that project um, uh, 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 translated quite literally in many ways to a project that we that Matthew and I began called Silver House Studio. Next. Um, and I'm going to flip through quite quickly. Next. Um, these are photographs of um, some context images of um, dark and tinted windows and highly clad buildings with landscape. Next. Um, and this is a model actually presented for Architecture League um, uh, when we came out to New York. Next. Um, and a section of this building, which is in some ways less about a plan and more about an elevation and a section. So the exterior is kind of highly clad and the interior is um, far more blanketed. Next. Um, and these are a couple of photographs of ways of thinking about blankets and blanket insulation. So again, kind of recalling some of the themes of, of Rough Coat, of thinking about protection performance, um, in this case, acoustic and um, um, uh, thermal insulation blankets. Next. And thinking about the craft of, of making and the labor of making something like a, like a um, tailored object. Next. And an interior image of that model. Next. Um, and we can kind of flip through these pictures quite quickly. This is a, is a large scale um, a set of, thank you, a set of uh, mock-ups, full one-to-one -one mock-ups of this exhibition, of this material for this building rather. Um, next. Um, and um, some examples of some writing um, that we've been working on and thinking about how to think about the politics of glass. And I'll end with a couple of images um, that are very specific about how to see things um, through um, sort of darkened images. So the kind of ways in which we image rough coat was also um, very specific the way we image um, our own work where some things are very um, transparent and clear and sometimes it, it becomes quite difficult to understand um, layers. So a sort of refusal of understanding everything. Next. 
And the last set of images are just of images of context. Um, and I would say that, again, returning to the question of houses and looking at houses, we're also continuing to look at um, different streets and avenues in Los Angeles and seeing it um, at different times of night and through different transparencies. Um, next. Um, and you can just flip through the last couple of slides. Thank you. And that will just end with this last shot, which is a, a piece that I wrote for LOG, um, really kind of returning to questions of seeing buildings and thinking and trying to unpack the kind of histories and materials um, of, of buildings as, as understood in context. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for the invitation to the League uh, and the committee for having us gather again here today. It's so good to see everyone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so next slide. Um, my name is Jennifer Bonner of MAL, um, which is an acronym that stands for Mass Architectural Loop-de-Loops and many other um, phrases and terms. Um, my submission to the League uh, in 2019 was uh, titled Just Roofs. And so here I'm really looking at the ordinary, um, reading everyday roof typologies, and I'm sampling like 50 houses from the city of Atlanta, which really cover a wide range of neighborhoods that um, uh, have a wide range of socioeconomic roofscapes. Next slide. Um, and this was the, the kind of project, uh, which was a called Domestic Hats, which was exhibited in Atlanta at the time, next. Um, and the goal here was to take all of the, this research and questions around representation and or, the ordinary and the roof type and, um, you know, try to uh, realize it at the scale of one-to-one, uh, -one, at the scale of the building. And so hopefully you can see the link between domestic cats and this house in Atlanta um, called House Gables. Next. And so although this is a very formal experiment, I think there is something that I'm trying to offer back to the discipline which is a kind of spatial and organizational device for others to use. Um, so if we start moving away, maybe from the free plan or the ROM plan, um, is the roof plan an opportunity to rethink the domestic interior? Next. And the project is really one that's also very technical. So this is a um, series of drawings, which is the erection sequence for the project. Um, I'm really trying to push innovation inside the realm of mass timber, next. Uh, there's actually three types of cross-laminated timber panels used in the project, ranging from three-ply, five-ply, and seven-ply. Um, there are 87 panels in total. We um, flip-milled each of the um, uh, panels. Uh, there were four structural engineers and a four-person um, crew from out of Seattle that put together the house in 14 days. Next. Um, and so this was an exciting day uh, for Mall. This was our first built project, even though we'd been in practice um, for almost nine years at the time. Next, next. Um, and so really the CLT, back one, the CLT is acting as a superstructure, right? So that the roof and these six gable roofs that are crashing together form both a superstructure, which allows for things um, like this bedroom to be hung from a larger roof, so like a roof room. Next. Um, and then I won't get into all the many ideas. I think what's really exciting about the book uh, that Anne and others have mentioned is that um, uh, it was really an opportunity to think about my submission of Just Roofs one more time, which was to think about all the layered uh, ideas that are in the project. And so this, is, this image kind of sets up one of those ideas, which is on faux finishing and how to use materiality um, against or on top of the CLT to kind of create these like backdrops for living. Next. Um, and then this image kind of shows the promise of maybe the roof plan. The house is very narrow. It's only 18 feet wide. Uh, so it's a very small square footage and plan. And so um, the possibility of having a uh, double height space or um, kind of larger interiors that are expansive. Next. Um, and what's been really interesting is to kind of walk, look at this project after it was built, after the submission um, and after um, our exhibition to see how people are using the project. So I'm kind of interested in the post-occupancy next, which happens to be um, 
several rap videos, uh, really the creative cultural class of Atlanta has like came into the house and done new and exciting work within their own practices. Next. And then there's been a bit of a reflection on that project. Like, okay, should you, should I have cut up CLT into so many different uh, pieces and parts and rationalized geometry? So kind of taking a step back, um, I co-edited this book with structural engineer Hanif Kara, um, who's a colleague of mine at Harvard in the GSD. And we've, um, you know, looking at the CLT as a blank. And so as a material that might be thought of or conceptualized as an industrialized object. Okay. And then lastly, uh, the project that I've been working on during the pandemic um, uh, is this last one. Also, um, I think falls within the, the realm of just roofs, but a really simple one where I'm looking at three to 12, uh, three to 12 pitch roofs uh, for um, an accessory dwelling unit um, at, in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, next. Uh, so basically, um, it looks like I'm out of time, um, was asked by the city of LA and Christopher Hawthorne to participate uh, in a standard plan program for the city of Los Angeles. Um, and really, like, is there a way to squeeze architecture out of these really small footprints and spaces? Um, I'm using um, a lot of graphics and also pointing towards ordinary materials such as stucco and the textures that are, can be created in type five construction next. And really turning to people like Charles Jenks and John Chase who looked at or termed the, uh, term the phrase false front and how these like small bungalows had uh, these kind of false fronts in the seventies next. And the possibility for like exterior space between a big house and then the small house in the backyard next. And then really maxing out the building code um, going from like 16 feet as a max height and seven feet on the interior side um, at the lower end of the roof pitch. Next. Next. Um, and then this was also an opportunity for me to kind of move away from mass timber and cross laminated timber and to think more technically about wood framing and to kind of self-teach myself with um, a new set of engineers um, how to uh, frame. So thank you very much. Hi. Um, thank you for having me back and both with um, this amazing edited and designed publication and for this talk giving a opportunity for reflection both before and after um, winning the prize. It's really helped focus our work on community engagement through public space activations. Um, this first project is a temporary site activation called Playa Chomo which means Connection Beach and was completed in 2016. It's located in a, the civic center of downtown Guatemala City in a disused parking lot at the base of a large green space that is home to the National Theater, both of which had fallen into disrepair due to a lack of government support. Next. In addition to drawing attention to the mismanagement of the theater and its grounds, the project's objective was creating a collaborative opportunity for young international designers who came to help conceive and execute the project through a hands-on design build process, which engaged sponsored companies, municipal authorities, and the local population. Next. The project drew attention to the cultural amenities above by creating a temporary new entry courtyard using thousands of uh, meters of upcycled fabric ribbons to create a kind of loom um, both uh, with an experiential pathway and creating a shade uh, as a public plaza and events place, event space, next. Due to the scale, its colorful nature and the participation of international volunteers, the site activation was successful in bringing people together around this creation of the project. Many community members became involved during the construction as well as programming events in the plaza, hosting a weekly Saturday morning education and entertainment program for children. Local news media covered the project extensively and many young, younger people became aware of the park 
and theater's presence for the first time due to its presence on social media. Next. The second project I want to share is both uh, a direct result of winning the League Prize um, and in combination with the previous project, which became for us the inaugural project of an annual community engagement program we now run each year. Our growing familiarity with community-based activations led to this commission called the Alloy Block, which is located in downtown Brooklyn, which went up last summer. Alloy Development wished to sponsor a temporary site activation at a heavily trafficked crossroads as a goodwill gesture toward the community during the three-year duration of their full block construction site. Next. The objective was to use the language of typical and New York City street fences and scaffolding to create a piece of public infrastructure that would be welcoming to all. A bright color palette animates the space and working within the constraints of Department of Transportation approved furniture and planters makes the project feel like an accessible part of the urban fabric and less like a precious piece of high minded design. Next. The site is continuously, oh, that's the wrong slide. Next, that's the right slide. The site is continuously populated by all varieties of people throughout the day with uh, everyone making it their own for meals, relaxing, taking pictures and so on, especially relative to other generic developer public spaces um, in the area. The plaza is also used to host sponsored events that have community outreach as their central mission. Next, the activation is visible at different scales and speeds and continues to evolve over time as the needs of the construction shift. This lighting went up last week and more elements are added uh, to be added this summer. Thank you. Thank you all so much for those presentations. Um, so if all of the winners and committee members could turn on their cameras, uh, we're going to transition now into a larger conversation. Um, so Anya and I, who were on the committee um, for the surprise three years ago, um, have the pleasure of sort of kicking off our conversation, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So please feel free already to start dropping questions into the Q&A box, and we will moderate them. Um, so it's wonderful to see all of you again and to, to hear about your work and see how it's continued to grow. And um, Ani and I will both be kind of asking questions to you, particularly unpacking the, the theme of this session, which is basically how have the last three years changed the way that you approach your practice. Um, this has been a time, obviously, of large scale social and political transformation, the pandemic, um, and ongoing climate crisis as well. And some of you already started to sort of touch on how you're reflecting on um, the creative transformations in your practice and how those align with larger global transformations. Um, I just wanna sort of point out the timeline that we're looking at here, that it was almost exactly three years ago when um, these folks had their exhibition and um, gave their public lectures. And in the interim, um, there's been the publication of this book, Just, which is celebrating their work. So we're sort of looking back at that, at that three-year period. Um, so it's been really interesting to see how all of you have already touched on kind of themes of political transformation in your practice, changes in identity, in medium, in modes of practice. And those are the things that we're going to kind of unpack in this discussion. And it's meant to be very kind of open-ended um, conversation really about how practices continue to evolve, knowing that these things are always sort of in process. Um, so I'll kick it off looking to the sort of political question. Um, obviously, this has been a time of significant sort of political reckoning in this country and globally. Um, a lot of kind of provocations to think about identity, the role of the self in relationship to communities that are, that are um, being collaborated with, particularly in the field of design. And I'm curious to hear from, well, from all of you, but um, particularly, so some of you started to touch on this already, um, F architecture, uh, you talked about this sort of tension between 
you know, refusal or resistance, and then an interest in care and support, and sort of how your political intentions might have, have shifted in that time. I thought that was a really um, interesting phrasing. Um, and then there's also this attention to sort of the vernacular that's come up a lot in several of the presentations and uh, that as a sort of gateway into reflecting on uh, local cultures and contexts and how the architect can sort of engage with those histories. So um, I'd love to kind of throw that to several of you, um, maybe F Architecture, Rachel, also thinking about your process and sort of how that continues to evolve and, and Mira, if you could um, respond to those prompts, that'd be great. Maybe F Architecture, do you all wanna jump off, jump in on that? Yeah, um, thanks for that question, Bryony. Uh, I think, I, I think maybe we're not trying to pit um, our sort of, um, bratty invocation of no, the sort of insistence on refusal against this sort of like embrace of um, respite, care and support, but try and understand how those two things are really integrally related and um, sort of provide the conditions of possibility for the other. Um, and I think the pandemic allowed us to say no, <laughs> like it gave us the sort of opportunity to re refuse to do work um, that you know, was important to us, but still depleted us in a particular way. Um, and it channeled the work that we wanted to do towards um, not just that which would sort of support our practice and our belonging to each other, but the way that we were working sort of in and on the world. Um, and yeah, I don't know if Virginia and Rosanna want to chime in about like, what the sort of current direction of work is we sort of neglected to talk about what we're actually working on right now because it's so in development but has really germinated out of a lot of reflection. I don't think we necessarily neglected to talk about it and I think that what you were saying in terms of the kinds of risk that we all experienced as individuals during the pandemic um, created um, a different kind of relationship to trying to get work done. Um, and that um, involved our different kinds of health needs, our housing situations, <laughs> things that kind of happened as the pandemic was moving along. And I think they forced us to look at our relationship to each other and start to understand the way of being feminist <laughs> that wasn't just articulated in text, but in how we care for each other. And I think now we're trying to think about the ways that we um, craft environments and context to present that kind of uh, relationship. Um, I don't know if I'm contributing. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm actually recovering from COVID right now as we speak. So <laughs> these are the kinds of things I think we've been reflecting on. Like, how do we make space for these kinds of needs that aren't always predictable that relate to our own health in a practice? like this that um, isn't so heavily compensated all the time. Um, right, absolutely. And I hope you're feeling better. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> I think exactly you're, you're sort of pointing to this intertwining of the, you know, the personal and the work that has felt so present, I think, for so many of us during this time and really trying to reflect on the role that we want for ourselves in that work um, and questioning the systems that have been um, unhealthy in many ways. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear from others on any kind of reflections around that. Rachel, yeah. Um, in terms of how our works evolved with the times, I, you know, um, the massive external uh, movements uh, that have uh, happened the last three years, um, I think we've always tried to center the young people um, at sites of power, um, sometimes in a playful spatial way in that in our courtrooms, the judges don't get to be at the bench. It's only the young people that are at the judges bench. But as we've gone on, it's become more and more urgent to go to locate them at um, 
sites of power or discourse that can have a structural impact um, beyond culture change inside a courtroom. So they've had a huge impact in terms of how prosecutors and judges inside courtrooms see young people, prosecute young people, sentence young people. Um, but they also hosted a um, event with the DA candidates in Manhattan, shared their own stories and asked questions in a really rigorous way. And um, that was watched by a lot of people. And I think as shocking as it is, it's shocking that it's shocking that um, the people that are most impacted by the system aren't involved in the conversation who gets to be elected DA. Um, I've also stepped down as executive director late last year and I'm behind the scenes uh, working on the graduate fellowship. Um, but even, you know, I've always had to decenter myself um, as a leader and it's really exciting to do that in a formal way, exciting for the organization that people with the lived experience I don't have are stepping up and exciting for me because it was a big 10 years of leadership. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, yeah. yeah. Um, and Mira, if I could toss it to you, yeah, I think it's really interesting. Sure. Now you talked about class in your presentation and as, as one of many themes to... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I would say that that um, you know the thing about this last couple of years was that um, was that it, it it's been very it has had a massive impact on um, the way in which I um, have uh, developed a sense of belonging. I would say um, the you know when when I lectured for the Architectural League uh, three years ago, um, you know, I set up uh, a I started with a, a tour of, of a neighborhood um, and then I started talking about my work. And that was the first time I'd ever done that. Like, I was like, I'm gonna try and do this thing that I've never done before. And it was like, <laughs> I think Anne and Katarina was like, when are you gonna send me the presentation? Because it was like, I was like, I'm gonna just try and do something I've never done before, which is like, how do I talk about my work? But first, rather than just like jump into the, to the work itself, how do I like try and situate my own identity, my own like point of view? And then my way of doing that was kind of organize, sorry, center a, a way of seeing um, sort of my own environment. And, and uh, that felt very important because I think oftentimes um, it can, uh, at, the, at the time, it, it felt, I felt very um, sort of alone a little bit in trying to like figure out my own identity as a mixed race African-American woman, um, architect, academic, uh, you know, craftsperson. How do I like, I, I wasn't quite sure who my audience was. Um, and since the pandemic, you know, the kind of spatial collapse of and the kind of mobilization and solidarities that have emerged from this time, I'm speaking particularly of, of organizations like DMU, Dark Matter University and others where um, a lot, there's been a kind of a ma massive kind of um, a, a kind of surge of community um, of people who maybe identify as uh, POC um, or want to uh, really think through kind of the politics of, of uh, one's own education, of themselves as academics, and so kind of had a position. So I would say that one of the things, I don't think that there's been a radical shift in the way that I work, but I would say that I have, this time has been incredibly important because it's helped um, create a, a sense of, of, of a place and audience um, when sometimes that can feel quite, um, uh, you know, you know, architecture and the kind of academic side of architecture is, can be, you know, very white, very male, very kind of, oh, uh, and so to start to feel that you're not by yourself has been, has made a really big impact and given me and particularly in, in my own collaboration with Matthew more real juice and confidence to begin mm -hmm. to think about like how to write, how to, how to, how to, how to, how to, how to look at the world and how to build an architecture that comes out of uh, a very particular point of view. Mira, thank you so much for teeing up this question about architecture, identity, and audience. Um, I mean, from, from our perspective, it's a real treat to revisit these projects, but also think about your contemporary practices and to see where you're headed and, and how you're thinking about uh, these questions as we all evolve, both as a discipline and as a social collective. Um, I was, I've been struck by the role of um, self-reflexive identity in our practice. 
And uh, most clearly, Cyrus, you brought up this new project that you're working on uh, or that you worked on that renders explicit uh, a connection to your identity that maybe I'd never seen before in your practice and suddenly had emerged. And I'm wondering if you might be able to comment a little bit on the decision to work in that manner and to address um, one's identity background, um, where one comes from in the work itself. Um, and then if we might be able to also transition to, to Jennifer, um, and I'm always struck by the fact that I, I've always understood uh, your work is highly political in the same sense where you, you look at uh, the vernacular aspects of architecture and their relationship to their capacity to mark place, uh, to innovate through vernacular building technology, to create material scenographies where domestic life takes place. These are all highly political um, and charged ideas, which you uh, deliver without any kind of um, uh, marked uh, sort of uh, articulation of a political position. They just sort of are political in and of themselves. And so I'm wondering if we might be able to spark a conversation, Cyrus, about your decision to talk now uh, about identity and Jennifer, in contrast, by embedding a political ethos in the work without articulating its origin necessarily. Yeah, um, thanks, Anya, for that question. Um, yeah, I think that there are, are many reasons why I um, uh, have been kind of asking myself different questions uh, more recently. Um, I think one has to do with um, some of the work that McLean and I have been doing um, that involves um, uh, community engagement. And I think in those conversations with different um, members of uh, communities in Detroit, I think I've I've become sort of hyper aware of my own position and my own um, my own identity and maybe have been trying to figure out where there are um, kind of shared struggles, maybe uh, in terms of representation or oppression and, and where, um, you know, like and how I can also best support um, partners that we've been working with. And so I think this decision to, to kind of um, be more self-reflexive, I think has to do a little bit with that. Um, I also think that just during the pandemic, um, I was thinking a lot about like my family and, and even the reason why I'm here in the United States. You know, it has to do with my mother immigrating to the United States as a nurse back in the 70s. Um, and, you know, I think uh, realizing that that decision was not um, an, a kind of independent uh, decision, but actually part of a larger system of labor that um, was being exported uh, from the Philippines. Um, and this kind of larger, you know, transnational um, uh, relationship between the Philippines and the United States as part of a kind of larger empire. And so I think, like, during the pandemic, as I was beginning to read statistics about um, Filipino nurses being disproportionately affected by the pandemic, I, I was also beginning to connect that to my own search for how like Filipino culture appears in the world around me and was sort of realizing that there was a big void, you know, that it was like hard to actually find um, or kind of locate um, how um, there is a kind of shared um, spatiality and um, appearance to um, our culture in America. And so I think, um, yeah, like I, I think looking at or uh, observing that in the world and and wanting to kind of work on that in some way, I think that that was what led to uh, the film. And, you know, I think that there are sh like similarities between that project and, and some of the work that I had already been doing. But I just think that um, that project has really helped to sharpen and clarify my worldview um, in a way that um, I, I don't know, I'm excited to kind of continue thinking about and working on in future projects. Thanks, Cyrus. Jennifer. Thanks for the yeah, sure. Thanks for the question, Anya, or the the comment. I think you're absolutely right. I totally shy away from um, putting all of my agendas out there, um, especially related to um, kind of self identity. But I think you can read them right in the photographs um, that were shot by a British photographer called Naro um, in House Gable um, Gables. It was very intentional that I'm wearing a pink dress, that I'm standing looking out of the mirror. I'm in the kitchen. I'm like this um, 
single female practitioner that's an architect, but also as one journalist wrote uh, in Metropolis Magazine, the title of the, the, his piece was Playing House. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with all of those uh, narratives being thrown on top and it's highly intentional that I'm playing with doll houses and I'm making doll houses at the scale of one to 12 and being photographed in a particular way, um, but at the same time um, can kind of wrestle with and understand the technical rigor that it takes to put 87 panels together in a house and to take on the huge amount of risk as kind of an architect developer um, uh, and taking on all the risk of, you know, learning curve and, and how to put together a technical building like that. And so it's all underlying and it's definitely there. And I think it comes out in the representation and also my obsession with contemporary culture, specifically pop culture um, and the kind of creators that live in Atlanta and that, you know, have used the house, like you said, as like the domestic, you know, setting the scene for this domestic um, backdrop that anyone can use because it was open on the market for rent. Um, and so people are coming in like, Lotto and Doughboy and Money Bag Yo and shooting all these films, which I didn't show today. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's been it's de definitely something I've shot away from. Yeah, thank thank you for that. Um, if, if we could turn this over to you, Gregory, um, this question of practicing locally, practicing internationally, the work that you uh, shared. Uh, clearly positions you as um, a multinational practitioner and one that um, maybe subtly uh, straddles questions around uh, communitarianism versus universalism. How does one work uh, as a, a, a participant in a particular uh, cultural context or does one position oneself as an outsider or do we straddle all of it? And how have you been uh, experiencing the current political climate as inflected in your work, if at all? <laughs> Those are big questions. So yeah, certainly working locally as both someone who's an outsider based um, in a culture, more of an expat allows you to develop a unique perspective and see problems, um, sometimes through blinders where you're uh, isolating and exaggerating and um, can be kind of guilty of cultural appropriation, but uh, also being able to bring a fresh voice to problems which are, especially working in um, the public space, problems which are very much evident. Uh, it's just everyone kind of uh, maintains their own territory, tends their own grass, and that that is true. Uh, in Brooklyn, the projects I showed had to be um, sort of um, door knocked from every city agency and cultural, and everyone had their own two cents, but nobody was actually willing to take on any collaborative aspect. It was everybody had something sort of critical to say about it. And very few people wanted to join in in, in the collaboration. And so um, throughout the evolution of our work, we've identified something, as you mentioned, um, that we stupidly call kind of lowest common denominator design, which is really trying to make as broad a based appeal to everyone as possible. And that allows uh, for any member from gatekeeper to the passerby to come in and feel like they can access the work, which means that it sets up projects to be most likely to be successful and to be taken on um, with a degree of authorship, both by uh, allowing community members to come in during the participation in the work so that the act of building becomes a part of the public art or for the end result and to um, attract attention from maybe the most um, kind of unfamiliar person with, with um, what architecture has as its agenda. Thank you, Gregory. 
Um, and we're joined by Isabel as well, um, also a member of the committee. Um, and I want to remind the audience also to drop your comments in the Q&A. We'd love to hear from you as well. Um, and we can, we can read those out. Um, we're also really interested in this question of media, which is something that you all experiment with and in very different ways. But um, I mean, something that I love about yeah, all of the yeah. work is this sort of um, investment in materials that create intimacy. And speaking of playing house, Jennifer, there's this sort of domestic quality to a lot of the, you know, the use of textiles, this interest in play in the scale of the body and bringing that into public space in, you know, in a disruptive way into places like the courtroom uh, with Rachel or, you know, with F architecture, having the intimacy uh, that you're creating in those gallery spaces. Um, Greg, with the kind of tactility of the public work. And um, I mean, it could go on and on. Mira, you talked about that explicitly in terms of bridging exteriority and, and intimacy. Um, and I think it leads to a lot of very interesting material experiments, like you said, with this sort of flexible stucco on blankets. Um, and so I, we're wondering how has your approach to materials and mediums transformed in this time as well? And um, Isabel, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know that this was an interesting thing to you too. So um, feel free to jump in as well. Yeah, um, well, hello everybody. I'm sorry I'm late, um, but due to the um, circumstances in which <clears throat> probably everybody's practice has evolved during this last uh, two years, we're uh, extremely interested in and how you relate to medium differently today. Maybe we can, let's see, who should we call on? <laughs> Anyone want to volunteer? I feel like Cyrus is about to say something. So Rachel looked like she was right there. <laughs> I just don't like awkward silences, but um, would someone else like to go? Because I can totally say some things about medium. Um, Oh, yeah, I'll just say that it's always been important for us to choose um, things that are accessible, but also that signal celebration, acknowledgement, you know, like a cheesy birthday party, barbecue or a picnic, um, and like inserting that as an immersive experience inside the courtroom, which is um, very formal and very scary and um, structured around power between people. Um, you know, the power people have is re reflected directly in the architecture. Um, and, you know, because, you know, racism and oppression um, aren't something that we understand cognitively alone. It's what we experience in the body. Um, it's the phys physiological um, response that we have unconsciously it's a social and emotional dynamics and we really tried to play with all of those things since um since covid um you know in-person events the social emotional interaction um part piece of it and the physiological piece of it um has been extremely difficult and so in the immersive um exhibition online um, we really leaned heavily into story and the young people's story and their self-representation. And we tried to create an experience <laughs> where you're visually kind of cued into some kind of embodiment. And we chose to represent it with pink balloons to reflect on the playfulness and the, the youth of our young people, you know, um, and then placing them in dialogues that are powerful. Uh, so there's been quite a marked shift um, in that it's become more a dialogue than a complex network of social emotional um, dynamics in space and time. But uh, it's also really expanded our repertoire of what we can do and how we can transform the criminal legal system with the young people at the center. It's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, this turn to digital mediums and remote mediums, I think, has been so pervasive. and. And Cyrus, I think that's a nice transition to yours as well. If you could talk about that recent work. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, 
yeah, the, I've, I've done a little bit of work with video in the past, but I've never made a, a film like this before. And, um, you know, it was a pretty amateur and kind of scrappy process, but I think that um, I was really excited about the idea that there would be a, like a live screening of it too. Um, so it wasn't just a, a thing that existed online, but um, I knew that we would screen, screen the film um, like with an audience. And I think what was really interesting about that experience was that um, I did I did receive a lot of like comments afterwards from attendees that remarked on how without me sort of prompting them remarked on how kind of disorienting it was to watch you know to to listen to something that is being described to you that is not uh, matching with uh, matching the images that you're reviewing on screen and that you know particular form of disorientation or kind of out of syncness was um, for me like a, a way to try and um, like create an experience of um, yeah, like what it what it might feel like for like someone who, uh, for for instance, like a first generation um, uh, uh, person who is like kind of navigating um, this uh, the environment of America with immigrant parents. Like I think for me, I was like trying to to figure out how to represent those complicated feelings through something that um, you know a predominantly white audience in Columbus, Indiana, was going to be like um, uh, consuming and and and, uh, and watching and. Um, and so the, the fact that I was getting these comments from different audience members about how disorienting it was, I feel like, I don't know, it, I'm kind of onto something, onto a way of like trying to represent some of these complicated feelings that, you know, we, we really can only experience if you've lived them. And, and so um, that was really the kind of motivation behind working through something like film um, and, and, help, and really trying to kind of build that sort of empathic, um, I don't know, experience. Yeah, that's interesting that that disorientation theme that's something that Mira also brought up right not always allowing things to be clear but kind of evoking this uncertainty i'm curious to hear Mira, if you have any thoughts on how that's something you're continuing to explore yeah for sure i would you know i was thinking about um the question of medium but i you know and cyrus i, I really i thank you for sending that link to your to your film I'm looking forward to watching it in full um but I've um, been thinking about film and kind of this idea of time-based medium, um, not not because I think that that I or kind of we are planning on kind of working directly with film, but thinking about architecture as it's really a time-based medium, as something that kind of unfolds in time. And um, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, we've been doing is um, kind of researching, writing about neighborhoods, but also um, photographing again, also Cyrus in relationship to this question of like the nurse, but um uh photographing at very strange times of day like very 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 early in the morning like at you know 4 45 in the morning or something right before the sun when it's still dark or right you know when the when the sun goes goes sun goes down or some moments of the day when um particularly moments of the day um early in the morning when um uh you know when people are on the move, you know, it's much quieter, more tender time of the day. And also um, there are people who are moving in th through the city at that time, going to work really, really early in the morning. So again, kind of gets back to kind of questions of class and, and how kind of what is the, how do, how do we see the environment through kind of, um, kind of layers of, of, of labor, um, but also how do you maybe capture that in a sort of very kind of pregnant sort of image and the way that light is, 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 is positioned and um, so I think that like um, the these these things are kind of um, you know the first time I right after the architectural league actually Brian e, she she edited um, log forty eight um, I attempted to try and think about the kind of layers of meaning and and kind of layer kind of pack content through an idea about a conversation this was a written piece an idea about a conversation that unfolds in time and this was between me and a colleague of mine and friend and and talking about the way in which um, a building um, a site can can um, can can hold so many different um, uh, kind of the presence of the building has significance it's maybe history and its relationship to um, uh, um, an ornament and colonialism, but also one's own personal relationship to a site. Um, so trying to bring together very different, um, uh, the status of content, quite, quite overlaying different types of information um, about, um, about a, a kind of an artifact or, or, a, or a condition in the city. So I think that um, both, let's say through writing, but also through kind of difficult images, um, how do you, um, in a kind of, I would describe it almost kind of in a quiet manner. How do you kind of um, 
pull out and tease up some of the kind of um, kind of complex um, scenes that are baked into kind of kind of our everyday environment. That somehow links to the next thing we wanted to <clears throat> touch today, because we know every small practice or even medium scale practice struggle with economics. And we wonder, uh, again, due to um, um, the circumstances during the last years, how have your practices uh, been informed or have had to change uh, regarding economics um, from uh, the price uh, until today? Um, have you have to maybe collaborate more or change the scale of the, of the practice? What has happened? I mean, fascinating that um, F Architecture, you've sort of said we've done less intentionally. <laughs> so that's kind of striking uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a way forward. I don't know if you'd like to comment on that. And I'm we're also curious, you know, Jennifer Bonner, you you talked about building your first project. Um, and then what happened? <laughs> you know, if we could if we could tee up those two. Yeah, I think like the crash into bed, except my bed isn't as sexy as F um, architecture. So um, <laughs> trying to get out of bed and then figure out what to do if I can't build directly after such a liberating moment. That it really honestly was a struggle. Um, because you know we were all just so in our, internalized and in our homes and locked down and, and everything so I think I just really turned to reflection and really obviously worked on the book and the writing for the book but also um, writing the or uh, co-editing the book um, blank speculations on CLT and trying to um, gather a group of designers historians artists engineers to talk about a materiality conceptually and theoretically and not through like case studies like okay here's another mass timber building you know so I was using that time with my colleague and collaborator in London to really get on zoom and to have more conversations um and and that's the only way that I kind of survived otherwise I don't know I was a little too sad Yeah, I think remoteness is often misconstrued as a kind of relief from work that you get to do it from your bed. Um, and maybe we've always been in the bed, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it has really intensified the kind of labor that we're asked to do. And I think most of us here are uh, working in academia. The what we're asked to produce in order to you know maintain a kind of mode of instruction or even support our students in ways that we never had to before all of that took so so much and um yeah we really kind of apprehended this opportunity to just like you know take a break from all that other stuff that you know um we came together to do to work um and it was better for us to spend that time not working, but being together in the ways that we could be um, or being out on the streets in the way that we needed to be. Yeah, and I think we were so overextended um, at this time because we felt like these opportunities to accumulate cultural capital were so um, few and far between and we felt that we had to take them even while I was kind of going through a health crisis. Um, and experiencing that need to stop was really, really difficult when it felt like this kind of practice that we have formed was something that I've wanted almost my whole life, you know, to have these kinds of collaborators and be able to engage intellectually in these types of conversations. Um, so I think uh, being able to take the time to slow down, but to understand that to me that that is what the work is to figure out how to make it something that can endure for a long time. And there have been many feminist practices that we've read about that have burned out um, because they haven't had that kind of connection and support. Um, but I think it was a, a really good opportunity to realize um, this um, thing that Gabrielle was talking about, which is understanding the kinds of dependency that we have on one another are the work itself that you're producing that interrelationship and then from that comes um, different kinds of awareness about how to operate and mobilize within um, 
a world and a kind of ecosystem where your labor isn't compensated and yet your ability to work is based on your body being able to do so much. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I think right now we're in this exciting place where, you know, we're understanding how this dependency that we have um, has kind of informed a lot of the work and is continuing to kind of evolve our um, own practice. But like, how is that going to be translated in a way that, you know, can can be viable as our lives are changing, becoming more complex. You know, it's at least, you know, I can speak for myself. This is no longer viable for me to have like two full time jobs and a baby and all of that. And this is a very, you know, material reality for a lot of us. And um, uh, how to not be exploited um, in so many ways. Um, and I think, you know, as we kind of are transitioning into this. Um, uh, more, I, I think this collaboration becoming more, it's always been formal, but like this formalization uh, by introducing maybe like the actual like monetary capital, which we resist so much, but um, kind of the next stages of that, I think will um, be exciting. And uh, yeah, um, I actually have to jump out. Um, I have a deadline, but um, it was really, really great um, kind of coming together in one space, even if virtual. Um, we've always been online, so this is a very comfortable space for us. But um, I just want to thank you all again. And um, yeah, uh, good luck with everything. And I look forward to seeing all of the work in another two years. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's very interesting that Rosanna was referring to viability, like, how viable is uh, for, I think she was entering the gender uh, theme. So how viable is for women to be uh, architects and, and practitioners and, and mothers and all at the same time in compared to uh, uh, men? Um, I don't know if, because today we are joined by many women architects uh, or also Greg and Silas, of course, are welcome to, to answer this question. But would you like to comment on that? How just uh, can architecture be for women in, in the practice in compared to, to men? Which we will probably need to keep short because we're nearing the end of our time frame. But I know there are a few people here, moderators and um, participants who are parents. Um, and that juggle, in, if each of you in short can talk about how you manage that balance. Um, or I'll call on you. Maybe I we- think, I think it. there's, <laughs> yeah, there's probably so many sure. comments here. This is like a whole other session that we could kind of- It's a different one, yeah. I think it's important to put space between the gender is something that's constructed um, and then the kinds of roles that emerge out of that and how they start to intersect with different kinds of systems, um, which is something that we've tried to do, but it's interesting to move from a critique of that that's written out to something that we're living um, uh, in a more direct way. Um, I mean, maybe just, and this is maybe not to exactly that question, or, or um, but I, I just want to reflect on the fact that I, I think that there was something tremendously um, uh, like forward. I mean, there when 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 this when this call for just came up, you know, this was at a moment in which the question of politics and architecture was really not a mainstream conversation, actually, in kind of an in, in, in academic settings um, of particularly of a sort of um, brand of, of architecture that many many of the people who are involved in in in, in this program you know it's it so I think that there's I think it's a really also a very proud moment to say that there that that the fact that the question of politics can um, has kind of flourished in in, in in kind of collectively not necessarily of, of the participants but across the 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 discourse discipline and kind of expanded field of architecture is it's 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 like finally finally happening <laughs> again 
not that it hasn't in the past, but a sort of new new version of that. So I think that there's something really um, kind of important to kind of reflect. You know, we, we think about we where we are now, but so much has changed in the last three years. It's like, it's pretty, it's pretty intense. And I, I think that's probably a good place to both kind of end and begin. Um, you know, as a, first of all, I neglected to mention at the outset who the additional jurors were for this competition. And they were Paul Lewis, Juliet Kinchin, and Mario Gooden, who's written a really interesting um, forward to the publication that touches on some of these issues actually pretty strongly. Um, and to remind everyone that this is a program that appears annually and the committee, which changes each year, purposefully finds a theme or a topic that is both open-ended but topical um, for the time that they're working in. So um, this conversation continues as it cycles through each year. Um, so thank you all. Um, both the winners and the committee who put a lot of time into thinking through all of this. It's been fascinating. And I hope that we can all get together in real time and space to continue the conversation further. So thank you very much. So great to see you all. Thank you. Thanks.